I think every decision that you make is dependent on the demands of the piece of writing. So it's not a, sometimes it's a conscious thing. You, you know, it's certainly in terms of accent, you have to make choices and, and maybe placement. Um, I don't really know. You'd have to point me at a script and then I'd say what, what decisions were made. Um, you know, for this film of mine, in which I also have to appear, you obviously, I, I think it's an imaginative thing, a journey that you go on and then the voice follows on behind a lot of the time. So if you're playing Louis XIV, you don't find yourself making a sound that is like in the street now. There's a kind of remove to it and there's a reluctance to commit uh, to another human being because you have to um, retain your mystery or something like that, I think. But I don't know that it's particularly conscious. Yeah, because, um, you know, the women at the court of Louis XIV were, I say merely, but certainly decorative objects. They were not there particularly for their mental capacities, although, as it turns out, you know, when he, he got connected to Madame de Maintenon, she in fact, uh, I think, in a way, was a kind of teacher to him, and he found a sort of refuge in her simplicities or her restraint. Um, but beyond that, it was all about how beautiful are you, uh, what clothes are you wearing, where did you buy your fabrics, what jewellery have you got on, how are you going to maintain your position uh, in society, I guess not a million miles away from the problems maybe that the odd female movie star has to face. Never mind um, women generally, it's still a rule, a world ruled by men, for men. I wish that Ellen were here now because, um, and I think there was a time when she thought she might be able to, but work made it impossible. Um, well, it was like working with your other half all the time. We, She and I travelled into the set every day together in the car and uh, talked about what we were going to do that day and how we would achieve it and and her job was especially complex when I was in a scene because in a way she became a kind of surrogate director and I trusted her hugely about whether a take was a good one and we should move on or not. Um, also I think if one was going to typecast Ellen in any way it would be her um, her freedom as a <coughs> cinematographer, the fact that she's used to holding the camera and moving around. <coughs> and my film actually anchored her a lot of the time to being an observer. Um, occasionally we let her loose, but um, I think it was quite a challenge for her. But no, it's her film as much as mine. Possible. <laughs> What do you do? You, do? you talk to yourself and turn around and say, how was that? I don't know. What do you think? Um, <clears throat> I'm, I was surrounded by actors I trust, and, and I've got to the point now where I believe that if, you, uh, if as an actor you are listening properly, then you might actually respond properly. So it's all about listening to me. comes down to trust, I think, you know. Uh, she and I have a kind, uh, an odd sort of relationship in so far as, you know, we acted together when she was 19 uh, in Sense and Sensibility, and uh, that was, you know, her first really big part, and I was playing her love interest in that film. So here we are 17 years later, and, um, it's a different kind of intimacy that they share, but it's a very profound one. Uh, and I, and given the, um, you know, you as usual, not, not enough rehearsal, not enough time and all the rest of it, it was great to be able to make shortcuts um, with Kate, because to go back to what I was saying about listening, she is the most wonderful listener on film. She does all her homework and arrives completely prepared, but uh, then she just is an open book. 
And so you discover as a director that you can uh, use every second that you have of her. No, it was um, simply to do with something called Harry Potter, which um, meant that, you know, when I signed up to do it, there were only three books written. So then along the way, there's four and five and six and seven, and then there are eight movies and you're in all of them. So although I was only shooting seven weeks a year, it just means you can't direct a film. Not really, because it's gone. <laughs> Yeah, um, Die Hard was 30 years ago, nearly. Um, and in many ways, Harry Potter feels like 30 years ago. Uh, it's a good thing about actors, you know, you, you take the costume off and leave it behind, really. You're utterly present at the time. I'm just glad that I was part of things that stay in people's memory. I think um, the great thing about film is that you can drop it. It's a very particular area of concentration and even memory. Uh, you know, the lines don't stay with you for very long. Uh, you learn them in a very present way. Um, you never know quite what any director is going to demand in terms of rehearsal or retakes or anything. So um, it's a very big marketplace of energies making a film. You know, doing a part for six months, eight times a week in the theater is a very different option. And that's, that's, that's the one that's harder to let go of. Um, but film seems to, you know, I think it's part of the glory of film is that it's here and now. And when it's over, it's over. Um, I don't know that it's skill, it's just the sound of a voice. Uh, that came to me quite late in the day after they'd filmed it. And so, uh, you know, I, I wish I'd been able to have a little more involvement a bit earlier. But um, so you were having to adapt to what uh, was already, uh, had already been shot. Um, I love. I, I would say I love playing comedy. I think there's something called comedy in everything. It's always available. You don't need to make it a gag. If you can make people laugh by recognition of something human, I think that's, that's available to you in whatever the part. Yeah, that was pretty challenging. <laughs> Those wings weighed 80 pounds, so that when they opened up, it was like a machine in the next room. And so if you ever watch it again, you'll see me being pulled backwards. Um, yeah. Well, Kevin Smith's a comic hero of mine, you know, one of the funniest writers around. Um, well, I suppose because I trained at art school before I went to drama school, you know, my eye has been paid for by the tax man in England. Um, five years of, uh, of training the way you look at things and and so I've always um, that's always been a, as an actor and obviously as a director but as an actor too I've always had a special relationship with the cinematographer I mean I don't interfere but <laughs> um, it was very special for me recently to make a movie with Patrice Leconte and, uh, and he operated the camera as well as directing. I've never had that experience before. And that was, uh, I, I guess, a, a real affirmation of this weird relationship or relationships that are involved in storytelling because he was looking directly down the lens at you, the actor. and. I'm very aware of the fact, you know, I'm not even looking at it now, but I'm very aware of this is almost like a human being. It's not so objective. Yes, I was actually one or two people who'd actually been in his home with his wife and children at times, um, small memories. And, and of course, um, the one advantage of playing somebody who goes on to be president of a country and lives to 90 is that there's a lot of film reference and you can actually watch the man and listen to him and um, work at it from that point of view but uh, no you're right about the American thing because of course he was born in America um, in Brooklyn and shipped back to Ireland when he was four so uh, the, the American links 
were as strong for him as they may be for Americans who remember him. Nope, it's still a you know, subject of much <clears throat> controversy as to who it was, why it was. Uh, I, don't, I don't actually know as I sit here now exactly what the circumstances are. There's certainly a number of, of in terms of investigations at the time, of course I'm sure there was, but, uh, um, but there are many books, many theories. This is one of them. <clears throat> well, now, as I say, I listen to tapes. And the, the, the only problem with that is, of course, tapes only record um, public speaking. So, um, you know, it's like assuming that JFK spoke to his wife and children in the same way as he spoke to uh, thousands of people in Berlin in front of a microphone. So you have to make an awful lot of allowances and, and your imagination has to take over when it's down to the I'll have another cup of tea level of um, dialogue. But he had a particular dialect, that's true, from Clare. And you know, in, in much the same way as England or the States, the accent varies all over the country. So um, that was an important thing. And that dialogue, that dialect certainly has a particular cadence thought about it um, and I don't know the answer to that one I, I just hope that people can see it as a, a, a to use your word a thoughtful piece of work by a thoughtful group of people no I mean I like you've said I, I certainly knew more about um, De Valera um, I was educating myself I mean I knew Ten years ago uh, was the first time that the name really meant anything to me because there was a film planned then, I think, that Chimino was going to make, and so one was aware of it then. But actually, even then, I had said, well, Liam Neeson should play this. So it's nice to see that full circle coming around. Well, I think it's a real luxury when you make a film that's actually part of the world that we live in, so that your life and your work, for once, have some kind of connection and uh, I do have Irish ancestors and so it felt like coming home in that sense um, but to be on a film set making a film with a group of people who are all honest crafts people is a rare experience and uh, that's very memorable. For what? Uh, I don't I don't actually know as I sit here now exactly what the circumstances are there's certainly a number of of, in terms of investigations at the time, of course, I'm sure there was, but uh, um, but there are many books, many theories. This is one of them. <laughs> well, now, as I say, I listen to tapes, and the, the, the only problem with that is, of course, tapes only record um, public speaking. So, um, you know, it's like assuming that JFK spoke to his wife and children in the same way as he spoke to a thousands of people in Berlin in front of a microphone. So you have to make an awful lot of allowances and, and your imagination has to take over when it's down to the, I'll have another cup of tea level of um, dialogue. But he had a particular dialect, that's true, from Clare. And you know, in, in much the same way as England or the States, the accent varies all over the country. So um, that was an important thing. And that dialogue, that dialect, certainly has a particular cadence. And I don't know the answer to that one. I, I just hope that people can see it as a, 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 to use your word, a thoughtful piece of work by a thoughtful group of people. Did you we know? We don't present any answers, so uh, it's just part of the debate. No, I mean, I, I, like you've said, I, I certainly knew more about um, De Valera. Um, I was educating myself. I mean, I knew 10 years ago uh, it was the first time that the name really meant anything to me because there was a film planned then, I think, that Chimino was going to make, and so one was aware of it then. But actually, even then, I had said, well, Liam Neeson should play this. So it's nice to see that full circle coming. Well, I think it's a real luxury when you make a film that's actually part of the world that we live in, so that your life and your work, for once, have some kind of connection. And uh, I do have Irish ancestors, and so it felt like coming home in that sense. Um, but 
to be on a film set making a film with a group of people who are all honest crafts people is a rare experience, and uh, that's very nice. The trouble with theatre is that, you know, I, I, I can only speak for myself, is that there's this huge fear factor that you have to deal with. At least on film, if you screw up, you know, you can, there's another take. But, and, I, and it doesn't go away, the fear thing. On, on certain nights, if you can, you know, if you can get it to push down into the right place, I mean, it's something that I guess, is connected to adrenaline and focus and energy and all of those things, but it's a useless thing. It's not. Uh, it's not really very positive, and it's just like a little gremlin that sits on your shoulder. And it's negative. It doesn't do any good. No, I just, I'm seriously thinking of trying to find some kind of hypnosis that will get rid of it because it's useless. Well, I'm just not alone. You know, it's a it's a common problem. But um, but then it becomes a self generating problem because uh, unless you can get your concentration into the right place then this little gremlin goes up into your head and while you're speaking it's saying you know this line but there's a line coming up in four lines time <laughs> that you don't, don't know, know. <laughs> and then your brain is going forward and backwards and trying to speak at the same time I mean you must have it because you're yes we're having a conversation on so, on some level I assume you're listening to what I'm saying and responding but there's also some bit of you that's thinking and uh, next or, or did I cover this or some cases not with you now it, it, this is a list of questions right here that I, I haven't I haven't asked a single one of them. good I want to turn a key in the hearts and minds of somebody it's not enough to get up there and just show off you know that's kind of pointless you, you can do that as a child at birthday parties you know we have a we have a job to do and I think theatre still has an important job to do um, fulfill. As I'm concerned, I'm not playing the villain. I'm just playing somebody who wants certain things uh, in life, has made certain choices, uh, and goes after them. It's, it's violent, but it's got a sense of humor. I don't think it takes itself too seriously. So, you know, it's not a Rambo movie. He's not completely invincible. And, uh, and everybody involved in the film has got uh, a turn of phrase, so there's a laugh around every corner. Die Hard is like the best ride in the best fun fair you've ever been to. I mean, that's really what it's like. It's like a, the biggest roller coaster you've ever been on. No, I, I didn't feel terrorized. I actually quite like um, uh, to be scared. By, but it's not, not even scared, but I like, I like the idea of jumping off a cliff. I like a bit of danger to be involved in the work, you know, some size to the challenge. So that was definitely there because it was such a big movie. Uh, to be involved in, and the challenge was inside that big, kind of broad um, adventure movie to, to make a person. Well, I mean, I, I suppose potentially the most dangerous thing I did, I mean, there was really only one stunt for me to do. Uh, there was jumping down from a ledge three foot high, which a lot of people do every day of their lives. I just managed to rip a cartilage in my knee doing that. Um, but that was because it was late at night and tense and noisy and, um, and it was my first shot. So that was living dangerously. It was the first thing I ever did on the movie. Um, but right at the end, I was dropped from 40 feet. And uh, they promised me it was, but now, of course, in retrospect, I think, what else are they going to say? They won't <laughs> want me to do it. But I knew it would be a good shot, so I, if I, once I knew that it would be safe enough, then uh, it was fine, and, and I'm not scared of heights or anything like that, so it was, it was, it was a thrill. Well, you kind of knew that, that the, the feeling of leaving your stomach up there was going to be coming up in a second or two, um, by the second and third time, yeah. It got a bit tougher because uh, in order to drop, you first had to climb out through a gantry and then be hung by a brace that was uh, around my hips and waist and then hanging from a wire. And you'd be sometimes hanging there for a couple of minutes because I had to get the focus right and then all of that. And then suddenly they pull the wire and suddenly you're just falling. And it's not as if it's free falling, you know, there's no wires, nothing. Just you and the ground coming up. <laughs> you Except get there was an airbag. I do enjoy making films, yeah. I went on to do another film straight after Die Hard and which is very different and very much smaller and a comedy, much more of a comedy, I guess. Um, not the romantic lead of the movie, that's Kevin Klein, but 
um, his, his next door neighbor who gets involved in helping him and Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio to solve a crime. Yeah, he was great because he knows exactly what he's doing. And you know, that, if you've got somebody who you can just see is confident on the set, and also off, you know, when the cameras aren't rolling, just being watching somebody who handles that situation as well as he does, um, handles his relationship with the crew and is very professional about um, being ready and, uh, and knowing what he has to do and not wasting anybody's time. Be confident enough to do that. I would just be going and whispering to them, for, asking for advice. And, and that's great. If you have a, a leading actor, I think they have a responsibility to the whole atmosphere of the set. You know, I always feel that a leading actor in a play has a responsibility to the company. It's something you have to take on board, and, uh, and he certainly does. Very strong point of view, and it describes a moment in our um, political history, in our history, where um, lots of certainties or things that we hold certain are disappearing. Not just the Berlin walls, um, whole systems. And uh, there is this blurry moment that we have now, which seems like Yes, yes, democracy wins, but some very strange people are kind of minnowing up. Um, no, I think it's the fact of the matter, really, which is the only reason I actually, in the end, agreed to do it, was because I don't know how people direct and act at the same time. It's a sort of insane uh, thing to even attempt, but the rule about being somebody called Louis the Fourteenth is you don't actually go anywhere. You stand still and people come to you. Didn't really, well, I mean, I, you kind of, feel like a producer. And my other role in it is, is screenplay, yeah. but um, really and truly it's Alison's, you know, every word of it is Alison Deegan's and Jeremy Brock and I, I think I said somewhere along the line, you know, she made the bricks and we came in with the cement and the trowels. It's true, she's um, phenomenally talented in a completely fresh and original way. It may help that her husband is Sebastian Barry great novelist and playwright, so, you know, words and language and Irishness are in the house. I don't know that there's any rule to it all. You know, I've been very lucky with the directors that I've worked with who are, are very sympathetic to actors and also challenging. I think maybe the difference having an actor direct actors is you, you kind of, you know, you, you all share the same bruises. Mm, mm. Um, and maybe... You get it. Maybe, maybe actors uh, give the acting a little more time and, uh, you know, you ask for rehearsal. I, I mean, what I love about the script and, and Alison's imagination is the fact that, in a way, it is a very complicated backdrop, but it's actually a kind of eternal love story. And um, it feels like a real counterpoint to the times. And, and at the same time, I think what's good about it is that you you sort of forget the period and you just start to, you know, one of the things I said to the costume designer is, please don't make them costumes, make them clothes. Mm. And, to the, and to Ivana, who did all the hair and makeup, please don't let anybody look as if they've just come out of the hair and makeup van. <laughs> so, you know, there is hair that's, we were in the real thing, you know, we were filming at Blenheim Palace. We had three days in that extraordinary place and uh, Duke of Marlborough, um, the late Duke of Marlborough, uh, let us film in the state department uh, apartments that nobody's ever filmed in before so you know half of you is like a kid in a toy shop and then the weird thing about making a film is that you you colonize wherever you are and you go okay it's mine now mm -hmm. I think it's the best thing she's ever done I, I think it's a really magnificent performance because it's so simple and uh, and I, th I know she identified hugely with the role uh, You've got to remember that it's a it's a ludicrous uh, setup to say that there could possibly have been a woman landscape gardener at that time. That's in a way that's the metaphor and point of the film. Couldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. Women were just there to be decorative objects at that time. So and that's kind of the point. And as much as Kate is effortlessly beautiful, she also loves getting dirty. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. a. <laughs> She's, uh, you know, she's amazing at doing all the research. And then the good news is that when it, when the cameras are rolling, she just drops it and listens and answers. 
Yeah, and she has a go because she has to, because uh, that's the only way she, you know, she's a sing was a single parent, which is one of the points of the narrative. Mm -hmm. She's got to feed her kid, or did at that part of time before something happened. But uh, yeah, like a lot of people, you go, well, these are my circumstances. I just have to deal with it. Well, what made it happen on a practical level was just the fact that I was free to do it once the Harry Potter franchise experience. Um, ghost train <laughs> mammoth enterprise had finished because uh, although by the end I was only shooting seven weeks a year on that it still prevented me from directing a movie although I'd been directing during that period in the theatre I don't know you, you read a script and uh, I was free eventually to be able to do it and it was just beautiful writing and a great theme and uh, and you just find yourself saying I want to direct this. I'm not sure that it's a conscious um, process. Sitting here now talking to you, you think, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure every director says the same, and, uh, and comfortingly, I think they do. Uh, fortunately, making a film is such a moment by moment, day by day, minute by minute experience, as you're counting pennies or looking at your watch or watching the weather. Uh, and all of these things are so much bigger than you are. And uh, so, it, I don't know, it's a moment by moment existence uh, and somehow you just get on with it. <laughs> just because there's a bit of it about now. I don't know how actors do it when they're in almost every frame of it. I <laughs> do not understand because I don't know how to split concentration. Um, Maybe I have to go on a course or something if I'm ever going to do it again because I was just relieved I wasn't in it so much. Uh, absolutely. By the time we got to the point of, you know, it, it could be funded, we are ready, um, you know, the, the, the spirit is willing here. Um, yeah, absolutely, because you think, who else are you going to cast? Um, yeah, but I, again, I don't, I, I'm full of admiration for film directors who uh, have the ability to jump straight from one to another. I need to step back and uh, and maybe act a bit first. Um, very much Ellen Curious, the brilliant DP, um, because she said, I want to shoot on film. I'm going to have to be using candles throughout this film uh, when we're, you know, in, in rooms, certainly at night. Um, and there's a blackness that is going to be very much part of the frame and it's so much richer and denser when it's on film and okay Ellen, go with it. <laughs> um, I think it's just, uh, it's an instinct or an impulse, you, you, page one, page two, page three and then pictures start jumping around and because I have an art school background and then ran a design group, it's like Okay, that bit of me is waking up uh, and joining itself up with the actor bit, and then that means you want to direct this. Depends on turning that script page, you know. It won't be without the kind of animal response to something and saying, I need to make these pictures real. I did. I mean, it's the thing about the film is, of course, that all of that, you can only call it stuff, is uh, the backdrop to what is a, actually, I hope, a very modern story about a man and a woman slowly growing together and uh, figuring out who they are as individuals before they become a couple. Um, but of course the background needs an awful lot of homework to be done. Thank God for movies where every department has a real expert. So James Merrifield's uh, workroom was like a museum and a fabric shop and uh, um, calligraphy center. It was um, it was beautiful to watch it all coming to life. Well, I said to her, every so often it should feel like we just stop, sit uh, sit back and see a kind of tableau or painting or something of the period, and then we move into it. And that was really taking her out of her not out of her comfort zone. I think she became quite excited by it because you know she's she's usually a very free and easy cinematographer and. Uh, this is really quite still and controlled for her, but I think she did an amazing job. Um, and that comes out of going to Versailles and um, hearing stories about Louis going to sleep with 80 men watching him. And you kind of figure why, and a way of controlling them and making sure they couldn't plot against him because they all had to stand there and just stare at him through the night. 
you're now directing. Well, everything, really. I mean, I, what's wonderful about Kate is the fact that as a director, you've got somebody who doesn't walk onto the set saying, what are we shooting today? She knows exactly where she is. She's done all the homework, but then she's uh, her sense of humor never leaves her. Her sense of enjoyment of filming never leaves her. So you've got this person who's alive head to foot as well as prepared. All of them one way or another, because uh, you know whether you like the way somebody's working or don't, you're then forced to go, and what would I do in this circumstance? And so you, uh, you always learn from it. But um, I, I, was very uh, influenced, I suppose, by a memory of working with Anthony Minghella when it was his first film, and he gathered all the actors and crew together, and he said to on the first day, he said, OK, everybody, I have one word, help. And I thought, well, that's vulnerable. So it's OK. And, and then over the years, you learn very much that one of the most reassuring things a director can ever say to an actor when asked a question is, I don't know. Then everybody go. Oh, okay, we'll find out. Um, maybe the same answer to acting. Really, it's not. It's not a very conscious choice. A lot of the time, it's just you know you you spend your teenage years and school years figuring out what it is you're going to do. And if you're on the arts, it's it's like compulsion stuff inside your body that. Um, send you in one direction or another, and and or body, soul, heart, mind, bloodstream. Um, and um, when I was 18, I didn't go to drama school. I went to art school, and so I was five years of all of that, and three years as a graphic designer. And then eventually, when I was 25, I went to drama school. So at some point along the way, it it was getting the art school bit of me down off of the shelf because it had been trained and putting it together with whatever I'd learned as an actor and then the word direct emerges out of that. Well, acting's got its nightmarish qualities sometimes, I can assure you. Uh, just standing in the wings thinking, what the hell am I doing here? Um, and knowing you're going to be doing that for six months um, eight times a week can be. Uh, yeah, but it's storytelling, and telling a story, I'm sure novelists find their job nightmarish, you know, sitting alone and staring at a piece of paper. But telling a story is a compulsive thing to want to do. It's not as if you seem to have much choice in it. There's a story that's demanding to be told, and once I'd read the script of this film, I knew that I was stuck to it and uh, had to make it happen. Alison Deegan, whose name is on the credits as one of the screenplay writers, so is mine and Jeremy Brock's, but we were really there as a kind of editing device or structural help to a script that is hers, really, or the idea is hers, the research is hers, the invention of it is hers because Kate's character of course couldn't possibly have existed at that time. You would not, so in a way the point of the film is there would not have been a woman who was anything other than a decorative object at that time. So that's already fascinating. And the fact that Alison had never written a script before, uh, the fact that when it landed through my letterbox quite a while ago, uh, you're reading something by somebody who's seriously dyslexic, as in, not just no punctuation, she only knew to put commas in, and they're in they're there after almost every second word, just as a kind of tick. So pretty hard to read, but and 180 pages of it. So a lot of editing you knew was going to be going on, um, but at the same time, you know, wonderfully fresh story idea and, and also dialogue. I admire them all hugely as actors. And then you have to think, well, why do I admire them all as actors? And they're all truth tellers and they're all they all value listening as much as performing. And so you know that the silences are gonna be um worth something and just 
you can put the camera on Kate for hours as she's listening to somebody else and she's playing somebody who's having to figure out who she is as indeed is Matthias uh, and you've got two faces that are thinking all the time and that to me is often much more interesting than the person who's speaking uh, and and it so happens that I think that Kate and Matthias had great chemistry together so you know, there's a sexual charge between them that's really important, and you can't even pin that down. It's like the space between two people. There's just this invisible line that you can twang. That certainly is true in the theatre. You know, Adrian Scarborough and Adrian Schiller, who play the two guys at the beginning of the interview, Stephen Waddington, who plays Dura, these are all terrific. Um, and so, in a way, Kate became the person for the part because she became old enough. Um, you know, the, the pressure on actresses is so much to be young enough that actually it was a sort of a relief to be able to say, you're actually too young to play this part, uh, until she was in her thir late 30s. Um, uh, because, of course, it had to be a woman you could believe was a professional and could have had a six-year-old daughter who died. Um, that's part of the narrative. So... It was sort of obvious, really. And also, you know, she's um, passionate about playing independent women. Rehearsal, uh, first of all, you ask for rehearsal to be built into the budget. And so we, uh, in the end, you only had like 10 days, but it's still enough time to be in a room with a text, with actors, and not with somebody with a stopwatch and a clipboard. So it's just you guys. Um, talking it through and people have come and done their homework and you know some of that was necessary for a project like this but then it's just about saying the words and then talking so uh, you know a friend of mine once said that you know a rehearsal, a rehearsal room should be a marketplace and I really believe that that um, well this is what I think what do you think oh that's interesting well let's do that then well, let's try this. Oh, wait a minute, here's a completely new idea. Uh, and when you've got people like Kate and Matthias, if we just take those two, never mind the others who all, and Stanley has, is, is also a film director, and yes. a very fine one. Yeah. That's difficult not to be aware of when he walks onto the set and he's looking around with a very different set of eyes to everybody else. Kate probably should direct a film. You know, I've said that to her. She's got such a kind of acute brain. Um, I think there's just hopefully a lot of mutual respect in the air, and, uh, but we all work from the same standpoint, which is the story is Im the important thing. Um, you know, I don't know how people do it. Uh, obviously, there's enough examples around, but it's just a nightmare. You know, you, your entire being is focused on this event called making a film and then somebody's tying you up into bows and boots and sticking a wig on your head and you've got to sort of alter your focus. The only thing that made it bearable was the fact that in a way Louis the Fourteenth is a sort of film director waiting for the f movies to be invented. Maybe he wouldn't have built Versailles if he could have made films. You're walking through a production office that's filled with 100 people working away, and me and the producer know that if there isn't a phone call, by the time we finish that day's work, those people are all going home tomorrow. But you have to start, and then you hope the phone call comes. And so, yes, huge... Um, kudos to Lionsgate and the BBC, but, but also to some independent funding sources that don't particularly wish to be credited for that. I suppose we all have somebody like Orson Welles to look back on and think, well, there was an extraordinary self-made entity who fought tooth and nail to get his films made. If the costumes didn't arrive, he dressed people in sheets and said, that's what this scene's going to be about, because we haven't got anything to put them in, and then it becomes an iconic scene. Um, and meanwhile, he's producing and acting and directing. That's not for me, but I think you have to, if you're involved in the arts at all, one of your jobs is to put your finger endlessly up to the wind. And 
And these days, that wind so much involves social media and the way that people in the future are maybe not going to go to the movies in quite the same way. They're all going to sit at home and have home movie theatres. And so I'm battling against that because I love being in a cinema with 300 or 400 or 800 people being told a story. And I still think that storytelling is like blood. Um, you know, it's how we understand who we are. And if we've all got our heads down on iPhones and um, iPads, um, we're lost. We've got to sit down in the dark and have once upon a time said to us, a lot of it's round up the usual suspects. You know, you and I could probably sit here and, you know, talk about the same movies and the same directors. I've been very lucky to have worked with some amazing directors and learnt from them, and, and, and half of them are nutcases in the best possible way. <laughs> you know, you watch... I've watched uh, Mike Newell shout at a cloud, middle of a field e eating a pink ice bun at l lunchtime, um, etc., etc. And I, ha I did sit, my great hero was Robert Altman, and I have sat opposite him, um, knowing that I was going to not be in a film that he made um, because I didn't quite believe in the character enough. But you know, if I think back to when I sat in the cinema and watched Nashville, and I think this movie's changing my life in some way. And there's even a moment in Little Chaos which is absolutely um, stolen from Nashville in a way, which is when Kate is listening to Matthias sing a song. And that's um, when Lily Tomlin is um, in that club in Nashville. And you think, look at that actress doing absolutely nothing. She's not moving a muscle, and you know she's falling in love. And you think there's the power of cinema to tell that story about that relationship and that woman and what that relationship is going to be with Keith Carradine singing. I wouldn't have done the movie if I hadn't have been. I mean, that's actually what interested me, or one of the things that interested me most is not only is that the truth, but that's a little bit of the truth. I mean, that is the Aboriginal's history, is of a country that was theirs, and along came the marauding English, put up fences and says, it's ours now, out of there. Um, so, yeah, it's not only the basis of the truth, it's, it's the whole truth, and it's much worse than that. Well, I, 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 Steve Dodd was playing my, um, I suppose, butler in the film, so yeah, I got, I got to know him, he's an adorable person. It is a very different, um, I mean, in, in as much as it's fair to generalize, um, they're very special people. There's a great deal of shyness. Um, you know, when they all came as um, a group for the big crowd scenes, they had to have their own camp next to us. It wasn't a question of our, our separation. It was, that's what they wanted. And they all came from all over the country in buses and made this camp had corroborees. They did a corroboree for us, which is you know, a special kind of dance where they tell stories. And, uh, and, uh, and at certain times, some of them went what's called suki, which means they got upset and got homesick, and then they just pick up and walk. So that's where you know, going walkabout comes from. And when you're in that um, landscape, you understand why people can just get up and walk into it. And it breeds a very special kind of mentality. They're very close to the earth, very close to each other. And when the big, horrible white man comes and builds you know, monuments to industry and greed and what have you, it's no wonder that that sensibility gets trampled on. So they're nervous. A movie. Um, and I actually, well, this won't make any sense in this interview, but I'm going to go and see that on Monday. So I'm on a plane to go and see what that looks like. This is the trouble, I haven't seen any of these films. Another one is called, um, actually I'm not sure what it's going to be called. It was called The Picture Book while we were making it, but it may be called Closet Land, I'm not sure. That isn't funny. That's about a political prisoner and an interrogator.
so you can imagine that's not going to be a bundle of laughs. Um, and a film called Close My Eyes that I just finished in England. And, that's and I'm the nice guy in that one. Good, I'm good. a really nice guy. Except okay. my wife is having an affair with her brother. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I deal with it nicely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alan, it's a short visit, but very pleasant. Congratulations on your performance in Quigley Down, uh, Quigley Down Under. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to the next films and the next movie. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. I saw. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, let me get it out. Yes. Yeah, I'd rather you not. The first time, I mean, you are there, your character makes contact. Yeah, I guess you, well, I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, because that's what you're supposed that's to do, I but mean, not uh, everybody does, not everybody does. Is, is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, not everybody well, thank does. You. Yeah. It's all that good British training you have. They get the whip out over there. <laughs> Nothing subtle. <laughs> Speed. All right. Better. <laughs> Alan, good morning. good morning. Here in New York City. The last time we talked was in Los Angeles for Die Hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were such a mean guy in Die Hard. And now you're in Quigley Down under another mean guy. Different kind of mean guy, though. Different kind of mean guy. Stupider. <laughs> but... I'm wondering uh, the re part of your character that has to do with the treatment of the Aborigines and actually having them hunted down and shot and killed. I just wonder if there's any basis in fact for that. I wouldn't have done the movie if there hadn't have been. I mean, that's actually what interested me, or one of the things that interested me most is, not only is that the truth, but that's a little bit of the truth. I mean, that is the Aborigines history, is of, a country that was theirs, and along came the marauding English, put up fences and says, it's ours now, out of here. Um, so, yeah, it's not only the basis of the truth, it's, it's the whole truth, and it's much worse than that. Well, I mean, the Aborigines would say it's still going on. <laughs> well, I, 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 Steve Dodd was playing my, um, I suppose, butler, in the film, so yeah, I got, I got to know him. He's an adorable person. It is a very different. Um, I mean, in, in as much as it's fair to generalise, um, they're very special people. There's a great deal of shyness. Um, you know, when they all came as um, a group for the big crowd scenes, they had to have their own camp next to us. It wasn't a question of our, our separation. It was that's what they wanted. And they all came from all over the country in buses and made this camp, had corroborees. They did a corroboree for us, which is you know, a special kind of dance where they tell stories. And, uh, and, uh, and at certain times, some of them went what's called suki, which means they got upset and got homesick, and then they just pick up and walk. So that's where you know, going walkabout comes from. And when you're in that, um, landscape, you understand why people can just get up and walk into it. And it breeds a very special kind of mentality. They're very close to the earth, very close to each other. And when the big, horrible white man comes and builds, you know, monuments to industry and greed and what have you, it's no wonder that that sensibility gets trampled on. So they're nervous. Well, fortunately, uh, one of the I think one of the better things about Britain is that they're quite self-critical. And uh, I don't think we mind being criticised if it's fair. Um, you know, we're an island race, so we expect to get a tat movie. Um, and I actually, well, this won't make any sense in this interview, but I'm going to go and see that on Monday, so I'm on a plane to go and see what that looks like. This is the trouble, I haven't seen any of these films. Another one is called... Um, Actually, I'm not sure what it's going to be called. It was called The Picture Book while we were making it, but it may be called Closet Land, I'm not sure. That isn't funny. 
That's about a political prisoner and an interrogator. So you can imagine that's not going to be a bundle of laughs. Um, and a film called Close My Eyes that I just finished in England. Well, of course, I knew Run, Lola, Run, like everybody did. Um, but I hadn't seen The Princess and the Warrior um, or Heaven. And, and then he's made a very fine short film as well that I love. Um, he's a remarkable filmmaker. Um, he's, a, you know, I said to him, it's like you're, you're not just in control of every frame of every film, you're in control of the milliseconds within a frame. So he knows the power just of an, when an eye closes and opens and that it, that becomes part of the narrative. So um, it's always exciting as an actor on film to be able to hand yourself over completely to a director. <clears throat> well, I think, you know, Bernd is in danger of exploding with passion one day. He's like so passionate that, and that, that's a great thing to have in a producer because it means that they're involved and he cares so much about this project and he's fought so hard to get it made that I think that's nothing but good. And I see the way that he and Tom interact, and I know that Tom feels that support hugely. Um, and, and in a way, when Bernd isn't here, his presence is kind of floating around anyway. So, yeah, he's a great producer. Of course, knowing that Tom Tickfer was going to be directing it, and that was a huge attraction to me to work with him. And. Uh, and I suppose I like stories about obsessive people. <laughs> well, the important thing about Antoine Richie is that he's a father. And uh, more than that, he's a single parent. His, his wife died. We're not quite sure of the circumstances. But so he lives, I guess, quite a privileged life. He's a rich merchant and lives in a very big house with his very beautiful daughter. And. Uh, so I suppose the main thing we know about him through this story is that he's very, very protective of her. He develops one thing that he's confident in and sure of and a supreme expert in, and that's his sense of smell. Um, it's, it's not right, but it's perhaps not surprising that he becomes obsessive because he lives entirely in his own head. It's just uh, always a relief in a way to get a script which is about the world that we all live in and is completely current in its issues and the characters that inhabit it. So, you know, you're looking at your own life as well as other people's. He is definitely a human being at kind of either end of the story, you, you get a, a small sense of a personal life. Um, above and beyond that, I mean, the, the central issue in the film is something about which he has very clear, a very clear notion of, you know, how to control and how to respond to. You rely on the, the biggest act tool that an actor has in his or her armory, which is their imagination. You just have to, you know, we spent all day yesterday with Gavin talking us through uh, you know, the major military operation in the film, and we're looking at nothing, but he was very helpful in the way that he told the story, and because in a way he's lived through it. Uh, so you, a lot of acting is creating pictures in your own mind. A huge part of the story is Benson's immense frustration uh, with, you know, the shifting sands of uh, political personalities. He's in the room with people who next week might be you know, in another post, and and the way, of course, that professional politicians operate is, and business in all sorts of um, environments is to not be the one that takes the decision and always refer up to the next person. So uh, it is immensely frustrating in the narrative of the, of the film for him needing to act now to avert a catastrophe but the politicians not wanting to be the one who presses the go button. This is a very modern phenomenon that we're looking at at a screen in a room in Whitehall 
uh, at um, drones that are being operated by somebody in Nevada and we're looking at pictures that are happening in Nairobi uh, and we will get up and walk out into a London street and go home after all of this. Kind of a release to, you know, to be on the one hand wearing a suit and a tie but on the other hand being about eight years old. Yeah, pretty, well I mean he may, <laughs> you might say he's just an average man <laughs> but uh, with certain fairly basic needs, you know, food, sex, me, here, now, kind of thing. Absolutely liberating, yeah, it's, uh, well, I mean, you know, sometimes acting can be a great sort of playground, and uh, and this certainly was that, playing Eli. Pretty tough, you know, first thing in the morning, good morning, my name's Alan, what's your name? Oh, fine, well, would you like to bend over this desk, please? Uh, <laughs> guess, I mean, you know, it's a job. It's best to do that. Yes, I think so, so that you avoid any kind of uh, mutual embarrassment. Um, I think it all becomes part of the job like this, you know. You get up at half past five in the morning and come and stare at a smiley face that's pinned to a camera and talk to somebody you can't see uh, about a piece of work you've done is one part of the job. And another part of the job, I think, which, of course, it's really promotional is um, awards. Um, I think, but I think any sensible actor knows that parts win prizes rather than the performance. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, again, it's part of the industry. I believe in the film industry and I believe in telling stories. I think it's all incredibly important. We have to do it for the human race to survive and, and awards are part of promoting that. So um, it's always interesting to see where those choices go. Well, yeah, because you can do it in your pajamas rather than a bow tie and uncomfortable shoes. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I've got, I've got some pieces of metal at home with my name stamped on them. Um, but you know what? It, when you think about uh, movies and jobs you've done, really the image you have is of the people you worked with and where you were in the world. You know, it's a great trip, uh, literally, to. Um, to travel to strange places and spend time there. Well, I mean, I started doing some work with that with Tim Burton, and I said to him, so do you want funny voices? And he said, nope. And so uh, I'm at the beginning stage of it where, because it's a mixture of live action animation, stop motion, I'm in the animation part of it. So we've recorded me, and now they're going to go away and draw it, and then I'll come back and revoice it many months down the line. I don't think so, because I think he's pretty um, motionless, but you know, who knows? I'm not quite sure what they've got in mind. Uh, but you know, he's famously there with his hookah smoking away. Yes, but you only speak as Listen. a human being in life, and therefore, if you're trying to reproduce life on stage, and whenever I've worked, I talked to students, or indeed worked with young actors when I was directing The Winter Guest as a movie, particularly, I have, I have a, a, an absolute mantra, which is that you, you only speak because you wish to respond to something you've heard. So the notion of an actor going away and looking at a speech they have in their bedroom alone at night is a complete nonsense to me. Your, what you have to say is completely incidental. All one wants to see from an actor, to me, is the intensity and accuracy of their listening. And then what you have to say will become automatic. And then it will be free and alive. And then you can work on it and shape it and talk about it. But the basic kind of engine to it is how accurate is your listening and how alive are you to your fellow actors and, and uh, how accurate is your response and how bold. <laughs> Whenever young actors now say to me, what advice do you give me? Uh, you know, I'm thinking about training, I want to be an actor, or whatever. I say, forget about acting. Um, and I really mean it at, at that point in time, because whatever you do as an actor is, is cumulative. It's mm. about, so I say, go to art galleries, listen to music, know what's happening on the news in the world, and uh, form opinions, develop your taste and judgment so that when mm a quality piece of writing is put in front of you, your imagination, which you've nurtured, has something to bounce off of. Yeah, and you're in uniqueness. Yeah, and then you have to 
start learning about courage, I think. Courage? Um, yeah, because you have to be courageous with yourself on stage, I think, emotionally. Uh, I was talking about this this morning, actually, about because I watched uh, a while ago, jumping about here, but I watched one of those TED Talks with Jill Bolte-Taylor. Yeah. Talking yeah. about having... She's uh, been here. Right. When she had a stroke. Right. And she's there on her TED Talk holding up a brain and showing the two halves of the brain and saying, here's the analytical side and here's the imaginative side. And it made me think that actually one thing that actors and dancers, singers and musicians do is to actually use both sides of their brain at the same time. Because you have to hand yourself over completely to whatever are the emotional demands of a part. But certainly on the, well, and in front of a film, film camera, but certainly on stage, uh, you, there's this kind of Geiger counter, this laser or something that is at, at exactly the same time assessing what's yeah. happening out there and what's happening there yeah. to the person you're talking to. And did this word land, or now that one didn't land, now I'm gonna to have to pick up that word. But yeah. at the same time, the bit of you that doesn't know it's lying, because of course you, we're divided from the neck up. Yeah. It's just a load of lies. But the rest of you has no idea that it's lying. So uh, that's, th that's the punishing part of acting is, yeah taking the rest of your body into this strange place that it finds it hard to recover from. The relationship, it's just that, um, <clears throat> I guess they're bo they've both got very um, busy lives and um, that often leads to little chinks in the armour, if you like, and into one of those chinks steps um, a young woman called Mia who works in Harry's office. Same way it would change your relationship if you, with your wife for anybody's wife if it, a young woman in a red dress um, entered your life, your shared lives. I don't think he was expecting any of it. I think it hits him by surprise as much as anybody else. Um, as I say, it's just like a moment in time. You turn your head one way and one thing happens, turn another way and something else happens. But, um, but like perhaps a lot of men, he was weak enough to Given. Second of all, um, it, it's uh, it's good to work with people that you've worked with before if you you know like and trust them. And Emma Thompson's playing uh, my wife, and um, in a sense that means you know we almost don't have to rehearse the relationship. Not that we're married or anything, but we do know each other well, and we've worked together a few times now. Well, when I directed a movie, I was a first-time director, so I have no business judging anybody else. All directors are first-time directors at some point, and uh, I think, if, frankly, if you're brave enough to say you'll do the job, then uh, you have a load of courage to begin with, and that's that's going to be a huge um, advantage. Well, like uh, any good writer, he's got a very personal rhythm, and uh, and so for an actor, it's um, you know it's a it's a definite bonus to pick up a script and find a. a, a a particularity about the rhythm and, and the wit that you can just sort of dive into. You know, it kind of tells you how to do it. <clears throat> well, I, I, the comedy will come from people recognizing their own relationships in it, I guess, and and perhaps particularly the relationship that um, Karen and Harry have with their children. You know, they've got a difficult oldest son who um, gives them a few problems, but um, so uh, it'll be laughter of recognition rather than particularly laughter of gags. Um, well, it's quite nice to hand over the responsibility to the editor. I think I, I just saw him actually. I just good luck because uh, it's going to be an interesting job putting the thing together. No, I think one's very because because I've read the whole script. I'm very aware of what the other stories are. I think the good thing is that each of the particular tales that you follow in the relationship that you follow have very different colours and textures, if you like, so you've just got to land accurately on your own and stay with that. Um, it's about um, a long-lasting love, and it's about um, the laziness that can come from that and the regretfulness and, and the truth of that love and the need of it and uh, 
and the the way it can something as powerful as that can be casually um, damaged if you're not careful. Well, it's great because uh, you know Emma's first of all a, a wonderful actor and she's very smart and uh, and she's also a writer too. So um, you know it's, you can have a kind of even Stevens discussion about the script, the characters, the relationship, and it becomes a proper kind of marketplace of ideas between two actors. <clears throat> At some time or another, everybody likes to either get or be given, uh, or, or to give some flowers or, you know, a song or some beautiful words strung together brilliantly. Well, I think romance is a, a, is a result. It's not something that you you're playing. You're hopefully playing the truth of a situation and a relationship. Um, yeah, truly, madly, deeply is an intensely romantic film, but I don't think we were aware of. We're not thinking about that when we're doing it. Every age and every social level, if you like, in there, and uh, so I guess it's that terrible phrase: "There's something for everyone." Because, as you say, after many years, your your life settles into something. If you're not careful, you're taking each other for granted slightly. Mm. You're, everything you do is still guided by love, but then also responsibility takes over and practicality. You've got to get the kids mm. fed and washed and off to school and um, get their clothes bought and uh, and who's got the car keys. And well, We weren't really around the others very much mm. or, or at all. Um, little um, intersections at odd moments, mm. but... You want to have to just have a memory of what it was from having read the script and think, mm. well, OK, there's those colours, those atmospheres, this is ours. I think everybody was guilty of thinking the film was about them. Because when I watched it the other mm. day, you do find yourself, while you're watching one story, thinking, well, I wonder what's happening to so-and-so at the mm. moment. And mm. you know that that life is going on. So that's, uh, that's a good sign. Well, I, you mentioned those two movies, and then I look at the calendar, and <laughs> I realise that one of them was made 28 years ago yes. and so it's really there's been a lot of water under a lot of bridges since then so it doesn't feel like such a change to me and you know there are some things you do that get huge publicity budgets and some that get none but every one of them is very important to me and huge memories yeah. particularly probably with this one yeah I, I was really blessed with um, the cinematographer Ellen Curious, and and actually it was a bit like taking her out of her comfort zone. I thought because she's quite used to having a camera on her shoulder and being you know quite free fall with it. And I said to her right at the beginning, a lot of these shots should be like tableaus, or or yes. the film should feel like it's occasionally stops to look at the world that it's in. The rest of the time we can kind of get in there, but then occasionally we step back and look at the whole frame. And when we knew we weren't going to shoot it in Versailles or indeed even in France. It was, uh, you know, hey, the movies, there are 17th century French interiors in England. We were the first people that have been allowed to film in the State Apartments at Blenheim and uh, Waddesdon Manor has a 17th century, loads of 17th century interiors inside this 19th century folly. Uh, mm. The dining room at Cliveden got turned into Louis XIV's bedroom, etc. Et the main reason that I said yes to doing this film or being part of it is because I thought the script was the whole script is is brilliant and also really important um, it's incredibly moving to read a script that is about the history of civil rights in America so very important that I was part of the whole and not in any way I hope an impersonation uh, I hope that there's a suggestion of who he is uh, and also you have to be very specific to the scenes you're playing and the role that those scenes have in the whole and then just the way he constructs sentences he'll he'll start a sentence and he'll put the eye of the next sentence on the end of the first sentence and pause so for example i could be i could be saying one one sentence and then i would be saying the second sentence. So those rules became helpful because it was somebody who was aware of how to hold his audience but also how to hold them back and also give himself time to think. Working with Lee is a definite one-off and I 
you know, I said to him on the phone this morning, so I'm not betraying anything. I, he gives brilliant notes. He's absolutely right about, you know, cutting something or shifting something or changing the ground slightly under your feet. But it's definitely like getting on a roller coaster and you're not quite sure where a hairpin bend is going to come up. Uh, it's a unique experience and not a bad one, a very good one. And it reminds you that great films come out of real life and uh, there are narratives that seem to be about one group of people but are actually about all of us. Um, well, uh, at the end of any great story, I suppose, like that, it's got to move towards a happy ending. <laughs> in one sense, uh, and growing up in, um, with Harry Potter, you know, you go from 12 years old to, well, a whole school career. I remember that, what it was like going to school at 11 and leaving at 18. I suppose you get some hindsight. Um, I, it's a very gradual thing with, uh, with the books and the stories, uh, you know, and I, it, it, there's no other way of putting it. You're watching if you, if you go to the center of the story with those three kids, you're watching them become young adults. And so everything changes. You know, they, they're three little innocent faces, only three foot off the ground at the beginning. And, and then by the end, they're meeting the adults more or less at eye level. And uh, romance has entered their lives. And as I just said, choosing big choices in life, uh, they're becoming adults. So it's incremental. It's not as if you can jump from one film, the one at the beginning to the film at the end and say, well, this is different from that in these ways. It's very much an incremental piece of masterful storytelling. Um, well, he's very focused. Um, you know, he lives within a very, very tight confines emotionally, physically. You know, when you, when we finally got to play a scene in what appeared to be his, his house, you know, I often wondered what that would look like. And I remember walking onto the set and saying to Stuart Craig, I don't know whether you'd have all these pictures on the walls. <laughs> Um, the books I could understand, but in a sense Stuart was absolutely right. This was the house that his parents built and in a way all he does is goes there and you can't believe that he would go into that kitchen and cook any food. You, you wonder what he eats. Um, is there a takeaway somewhere at Hogwarts that he occasionally orders in from? Because you can't imagine that there's any other agenda in his life than the one he set himself. You know, the, the world we live in now is one where we, where we, we leapfrog ourselves all the time and uh, we have to give interviews about things uh, before people have seen them. And so a lot of innocence is taken away from uh, not just children, because of course grown-ups have been enjoying this series of books, but of course I come into contact with a lot of hopeful little faces clutching whatever is their latest copy of the book being introduced or and, and we've all had this experience of being pointed out to children in the street or in or in some um, on a red carpet somewhere and once they get over their confusion that I don't have a load of black hair uh, then you can see a, a huge conversation going on with themselves and with this book that has opened up their imaginations and I've just never wanted to get in the way of that because it's precious um, and as I say a, a kind of innocence that you can't rip away from people when I walked onto the set to work with Richard Harris um, that's iconic and you think I'm actually sitting in a makeup chair next to this guy and I've grown up watching him uh, and then moving on to Michael Similarly, you know, when I was at drama school, an iconic figure to young actors. So uh, there's that level to it, which is just that you're working with these people. Um, 
And then there's a human level too, which is you get to know them. And Michael, I knew a bit before anyway, but sitting in a makeup chair with Richard Harris and, uh, and he's talking about Beckett and Shakespeare and Pirandello. And, uh, and then you go on to the set, Michael Gambon, your own all is only this far away from him making you laugh. So, you know, you're, you're proud if you've got a take where it, he hasn't cracked you up. Well, if you're playing somebody, you don't judge them. So I don't know about things like forbidding or scary or uh, mysterious or any of that. You take the information you've got in the writing. And um, Joe Rowling's quite clear. She said he never raises his voice. I think, and there was nothing ever deliberate, but you know, the nature of filming is that there's little or no rehearsal, you're straight into it. <clears throat> that means, and you're starting with three 12 year olds. And I walk onto the set with black uh, lenses in my eyes and all black outfit and a black wig. And uh, one thing I can say for sure is that as soon as I put that costume on, something happens. You can't, you can't be someone else inside that outline. It has an effect on me. Uh, and, and also you don't have time because you're looking for real concentration and you're trying to be as helpful to these three young people as possible. So it's better that I'm focused and not mucking about. Um, so I'm not surprised if they got a bit alarmed, but um, it, was, it was just the nature of the beast. Absolutely crucial, and I suppose it's, the, in a way, the one shame of the advance of CGI. You know, we started this whole thing going off to locations in Oxford and Gloucester, and. Uh, various gothic corridors and by the end or ten years later the the technique is so sophisticated that you end the film on a pile of old grass with a football stadium of lights around knowing that they're going to fill in the background so your imagination really has to work hard by the end of it but um, but the interiors we're completely blessed by having uh, absolute genius in Stuart Craig and there's still a child in me that goes up to a pillar that I'm this far away from it and I know it's made of polystyrene but I have to tap it because it's so real. Um, oh no, it's, it's crucial because your imagination is fed. There's a level of silence in an audience sometimes and you can feel it as an actor. And certainly there have been times when the screening of this film, when you know that the energy um, at work from the actors and all the technicians that I've talked about, and, and especially the writer, um, mean that you've got a captive audience sitting in the dark being told a story. This is a very ancient and wonderful thing. And it's, uh, it's terrible if we lose this. Um, you know, as times change and everybody sits at home with their huge screen and their five seats and their surround sound and they don't actually go out and sit together with a, bun a huge bunch of other people on and, and a kind of once upon a time level. Um, and I f do feel that tangibly that thank you, Kate, because she's so committed and so inside the story. So you really watch her learning about herself. You can almost touch her thought processes in the film. Um, and so therefore you can feel audiences getting genuinely involved in it and sitting very, very quietly um, uh, and being completely in, inside the story. So that's hugely satisfying yeah, when that happens. It's a very weird thing. that ha It's a bit like a kind of m microcosm of what I've just talked about because, because on the film set you may have a scene between two people but there's probably about 30 or 40 people with clipboards all around it. Everybody kind of knows. Um, there's a, a common concentration happens and thank God the plane didn't fly over or the sound man didn't come out from behind his bush saying, sorry, we've got to go back.
Well, if you're loved uh, and cherished by your family, then that's kind of all you remember. You don't, you don't particularly remember deprivation because your hard-working parents are fighting hard to put food on the table and... So you don't have any memory of being hungry or cold because they've worked hard to prevent that. When I was eight, my father died. So um, that was very measurably a time when we knew things were difficult because, uh, you know, my mother had to go out to work to um, feed us. So we all we were all brought up knowing how to make a fire and knowing how to iron a shirt. <laughs> Um, but that was our reality. Um, yeah, but she was, um, I suppose, going back to the story of the film, uh, she was a tigress. <laughs> uh, she was, she could do anything. You know, she could, so, all those uh, female things like so cook and clean, you know, she took care of those without even thinking about it because she'd been trained by her mother. It's it's a very Welsh thing, uh, that side of my family. And, you know, families knit together. So uh, a bit like a film crew came into operation, aunts and uncles and huge support system. Uh, for whatever reason, I was given the title role in it. See how amazing that it sticks in your mind. The title role in a play called King Grizzlybeard. And... Uh, and I remember, actually, I remember my mother cutting out a triangle out of a carpet, and that was stuck on my chin. But it was the first time I'd felt, I don't know whether it's about feeling the power you can have as an actor, but it goes back to what I was saying about that silence. You're involved in a story, and then there's a load of people in front of you, and they've gone really quiet. I went to a school where you had, I had to get a scholarship to get into it, but it, it was a fantastic school, and remains a fantastic school because it doesn't um, limit you. It's now co-educational. In fact, when I went there, it was all boys. Um, and it had a huge, and I think still does, have a huge drama tradition. But when I was at that school, which would be 11 to 18, I was also very involved in the art department. And so, and because it was a very high achieving academic school, the idea of going to drama school didn't really um, enter my head at all. It was a question when I was 18 of whether I would go to university and read English or go to art school. And I went to art school, but still with this thing drilling away in my brain about acting. Yeah, but, you know, whatever piece of my brain is missing, I don't know, it's never, ever thought that way um, about, you know, future income, never really entered my head. No, I, 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 all I really remember from that time is exactly where the letterbox was in London where I posted that letter saying, please, can I um, have a form for auditioning? And I absolutely remember posting it. Um, you get the costumes and then you sort them out and help the actor if there's something difficult to do button up or something that's got to be fastened behind in the dressing room and then if they've got changes down to the wings with the quick change costume and they're standing there ready in the dark with the shirt and helping them in out of one costume and into the next i don't know what the what the word would be about whether it's hungry it's a bit like being a child standing in the dark in the wings and as it happens uh in that production which was a play by John Osborne called West of Seward um, was Sir Ralph Richardson truly one of the greatest actors well I knew I wanted to do it and now you're watching uh, one of the greatest actors that ever lived and you're in the wings in the dark and he's on stage and then as it happened he was also on stage with Nigel Hawthorne and uh, a few years down the line I ended up working with Nigel Hawthorne so then you learn that the theatre throws these sort of things at you. You know, you can be, and even more so now when there's, you know, no, no real repertory system anymore in England. Um, young, somebody can come out of drama school at 20 something or other and be working opposite Judy Dench or whoever the next day or the next week. So you've got to be ready for that. 
But um, but don't, don't be arrogant about it either, because these people really know what they're doing. I did talk to her um, because I said to the producers when I was asked to play it, because you have to remember that only three books had been written when we started filming them. Uh, and I said, I have to talk to her because um, I don't know how to play this part, because um, it seems to be traveling potentially down two avenues at the same time. Um, and so they arranged for us to speak, and um, uh, she, I got through, put through to her on the phone. She was with her sister at the time, and she said, I can't talk now. So that's how close she held everything to herself. And so we arranged to speak the, ne the next day when she was on her own. And then she gave me one very small piece of information, which I always have vowed I would never, ever repeat, even though the books are now done and everything. So I, I won't repeat it. It wasn't a fact. It was just a kind of clue that um, there's something that meant it was possible for me to um, think he was other than. It wasn't even that she said that. It was just made him a little... It, there was something more human. Well, I think it goes back to what we've already been talking about a bit, which is that that means they believed it. Um, they've not been manipulated. I think. I don't think it is. It is possible clearly to manipulate people into an emotional response. Um, I wouldn't be very content with being part of that. You know, people still love that film. Uh, in fact, it gets used for grief therapy apparently it, uh, to help people to get through that period if it if it happens to them. Um, it's something to do with the fact that Antony Minghella was directing something that he'd written. It, it was so it's beautifully written. Um, it has something to do with the fact that Juliet Stevenson and I had worked a lot together in the theatre. So there's a, <coughs> a lot of knowledge of each other in the room and trust. Um, so you know, you know that it's possible to try things that are going to fail. You know that it's possible to try things that aren't going to be necessarily attractive. I mean, I'm not sure. And I do believe I, as an actor, am part of a storytelling process. I'm pretty involved in um, quite a lot of political causes, one way and another, uh, like Emma. Um, I don't parade my opinion about, about young actors, particularly. Uh, or social media. I think uh, a lot of that is the stuff of life, and and it's an evolving thing. Um, but um, no, I'm pretty militant in certain other areas. Uh, you learn as time goes on that it goes back to what you want pe what you want people's response to be to your work, and if if it's called privacy and guarding it, it means I want people to believe that I'm the person in the story. I don't want them to be thinking about something or other I've said in the newspaper when they're watching me. You know, be for example, playing Eamon de Valera in Michael Collins, I, or Ronald Reagan, uh, for that matter. Um, uh, I want them to believe that and only think about that. Um, because, like most actors, I don't enjoy watching myself because all you see is what you've got wrong. Actually, you know, one of your great actresses, Kate Blanchett, said at some point, the point about a horizon is that you look at it and you move towards it and it only gets further away. Uh, you never actually get there. And, you know, one has so many examples of people like Judy Dench at 80, um, still hungry, to use your word, um, and still... Um, wanting to be... Well, you have to hold your finger up to the wind at all times, and the wind changes. Uh, so uh, you can't know uh, anything. You know, I worked with a wonderful director called Richard Wilson, who you may know here as an actor on as Victor Meldrew, if that series came out here. Um, but anyway, he's a big star in England, uh, but he's also a wonderful theatre director. The only word he ever used on a really regular basis directing is about openness. And that's something you can almost taste if somebody's being truly open. Um, 
and it's something I look for as a director too. Uh, I don't know whether that's attitude or background or training uh, or how much preparation you've done, but somehow it all arrives at that word. Sometimes it's about selfishness. Uh, <laughs> it depends on the character you're playing. You know, you, you, it, can't, it can't be passive. You know, there's a kind of active nature to being open and a readiness. It's not sitting back. Um, generosity is part of it, but, but making a gift of yourself is quite an active thing to do and quite a challenging thing to do to your fellow actor or to the audience. Um, it's not a safe place to be at all. Well, I liked his energy and the fact that he's curious about everything um, and looked people straight in the eyes. He didn't kind of ignore people. Uh, curious about everything, but be completely hopeless with a dishwasher and um, and couldn't even work out that there was an on-off switch. You know, he's in the kitchen surrounded by suds and he hasn't actually turned the damn thing off. So uh, that's endearing, and his curiosity is uh, gives, you, gives you a sense of his energy. Um, but it wouldn't be enough were it not for the fact that he gets caught up in a, in a human situation, which is perhaps completely outside his experience and his education, where he's come from or what he ever expected to encounter. Um, and I liked the fact that he dealt with it sensitively. Um, I think he does know what's going on at the end, um, but he hasn't got the vocabulary to discuss it. And in a way, that's one of his strengths, I suppose, is that there's just a, a kind of silent caring for her, because I think if my memory serves me correctly, he's just he's, he's stroking an injury on her leg, putting some cream on her leg and saying, I don't want to know. But as far as I was concerned, the way he said, I don't want to know, said he already knew. But I don't know where you'd begin. I, I think what's great about him is he didn't say, get out of my house in any kind of Victorian manner. He was going to deal with it. I was pretty grown up. Um, I came back from America uh, straight into, well, I, I, think you would, I, I think they were two-thirds of the way through um, the shoot. I decided to turn that to my advantage. I didn't have any option, you know, and uh, I just thought it was an interesting atmosphere to walk into, and uh, I thought, well, that's a Sinclair kind of thing. This is interesting. Um, and used that energy to my advantage, I think. And, and also uh, Sinclair's um, sort of lack of knowledge about personal things. So um, the difficulty was, of course, um, developing a proper relationship with Saskia, but I knew her from before, so um, that was easier than it might have been. And then it just honestly became practical, like filming does, uh, you know, and all of that nonsense, arty nonsense, goes out the window, and you find yourself, because it was the hottest summer that... I mean, the film was blessed in that sense, because it was, it was lifted into uh, an atmosphere of its own every day that, that we needed it. There was this blazing sun sometimes more than we needed it. You know, we're shooting a picnic and the cheese is melting into the, the cloth. We can't eat it because it's now glue. Um, and we were having to use sunshades. And it turned uh, Cliveden and that area of the river um, into something mysterious and almost like out of Beverly Hills, if there were a river in Beverly Hills. That's what it would look like. So you were constantly made uneasy about the surroundings. Well, I, th I suppose the decision I took about Sinclair and his attitude to money was that he was born to it. It wasn't, you know, he wasn't a self-made man in that sense. I think he's 
he's obviously clever at business, but it's been something he's been surrounded by all his life. And so therefore, much like many of the British upper classes, they, ca they do have a sense of humour and irony and devil may careness about money. Um, and I suppose I was feeding off of that to a large extent. Sinclair's sex life is the sex life of many a British male, I think. Uh, you know, he, he, I don't know about him, because <laughs> he's fictional, but uh, when I was at school, an all-boys school, uh, there was absolutely no sex education. Uh, we used to have to um, beg the divinity master to tell us about sex, sir, uh, instead of religion. And that was that was just in a kind of titillating way. Um, wasn't really to get any information, although I suppose we must have done, because he was a responsible guy. And I, I'm sure Sinclair comes from that background. It's it's just ignorance. Uh, and when he. Uh, makes love to his wife and then turns over and reads a book. I don't think it's out of a hard heart or an insensitive soul. Just doesn't know. <laughs> but there might be more to it than that. Well, it's interesting going from uh, something like Close Fires to uh, Prince of Thieves, if that was the order it happened in, and I think it probably was. Um, because they inherit something that closed my eyes, and that mentality or that approach to the work. Um, I remember Mary Elizabeth Master Antonia, who was moving between my scenes and Kevin Costner's scenes. Um, she would, uh, she when she was on a, on our set, she'd say, "I want to be in his film." Which is not to say that there were two films going on, but um, it's my habit and practice and training and everything to look at the writing and um, and look for clues in order to give it a specific life and uh, the difference with a big Hollywood movie is that they don't often give you time to do that because the pressure is is on um, the set and the, the shooting schedule and and looking after people for different reasons because of fame rather than let's all get together and tell this story. As it happens, um, that was the concern of everybody on that film, including all of the, you know, the big names. Um, it's just a different experience, but you, you have to be, I'm the same person in different experiences. In a film before, I had no other recourse than what I'd done before, and immediately before that, I had just spent two years on and off doing uh, Les Liaisons Dangereuses, um, which was about many things. Uh, I mean, in some ways, the ultimate 80s play. Uh, incredibly um, sexy without anybody taking their clothes off. Um, very intricate writing. Um, and also, it, uh, by the end of it, it was just about stamina and how do, you, how do you keep it fresh every night. So it's what rules do you live by, really. And in a way, theatre just... And it's like Peter Brooks says, choose your church carefully. It's a religion. Um, so I had nothing else to take to the set of Die Hard, except to say, who is this person, where did he come from, what did he have for breakfast? And in actual fact, asking those questions uh, affected the script, because I said, I went for a costume fitting and I was, there was a kind of rail of terrorist gear. And uh, I put it on, but I said, this is, I'm gonna look ridiculous in this stuff, and I knew that all of the people in the film who were working for me uh, were like six foot high and six foot wide, and that's fine for them. And I said, um, wouldn't it be interesting if I was wearing a suit and not all of this stuff? Because if I was wearing a suit, then um, perhaps I could meet the Bruce Willis character and, 
Anyway, I went away for a few weeks and came back and started shooting and they'd written that into the film. And it became quite an important part of the film that we had a relationship and we met and I produced an American accent. And so that's, and that, was, and that happened just by saying, what about who is, where did he come from, type of questions. I think creating one space in, in Die Hard happened through uh, a mixture of um, belief in the power of storytelling, and that that's my part. Of, I'm I'm involved in a chain, you know. I'm in the middle between a script and an audience, and and unless I can be a clear channel between those two things, then I get uncomfortable and I'm bad. Uh, and you end up doing that awful thing that bad directors say, you know, just be yourself. Well, who cares, you know? <laughs> I would like to be this character, but in order to... So I, I, if it's chutzpah, then I fight for it hard, yes. You often have to change your vocabulary. You, you get a sense of who the director is. In the case of Die Hard, when I said to him, well, I'm about to shoot all these people, I mean, I first of all couldn't imagine that I was ever going to be in this situation doing a film like that. Um, I'm very proud of that film and its ironies and ambiguities. I don't think they've made another one as good because we asked all these questions. But there I am in front of a room full of captives and, uh, and, I'm about, and I've got a gun and I'm about to shoot them if they misbehave. And I said to the director, well, there's a buffet here because we'd interrupted a party in the scene. I said, um, could I just sit and have a chicken sandwich while I'm threatening to kill them? And he looked at me as if I was mad and started laughing. And then, you know, every time I said something, he would just walk away laughing. <laughs> but he let me do it. Because I think he knew that I was, I don't know, on some kind of jack of my own and that it seemed to be working. Um, Harry Potter is a different kind of thing because it's not exactly swimming in ambiguity. So, uh, you know, you have your outline of your character. You are very much part of the process of drawing that outline. And then you must step into it and inhabit it. Uh, my character doesn't come into contact with too much um, special effects because he's one of the teachers in the school and doesn't really go outside it very much which is where creatures tend to emerge or trees burst into life or people get into cars that fly um, so I haven't encountered too much of that but it's just, you know, it just comes under the heading of it's part of the job it's like being dropped from 40 feet into an airbag in Die Hard before, you know, that wouldn't happen now now it would be done in a computer and they'd be able to make it look completely believable but I was actually dropped three oh. times at three o'clock in the morning cause, and it was the last shot because if I died it didn't matter because they'd have it in the can <laughs> I've just been on the trading floor this is somebody who you know never got maths down as a 12 or 14 year old so I don't know what they're talking about um, but I was given my lines over the phones and apparently I made some deals on behalf of spinal muscular atrophy, which is what I'm here representing. This is an amazing opportunity for smaller charities who don't have big budgets to develop research or even tell people about you know, what's going on. You need the big brother element to come in and help the little people.